All right. So our, we, obviously we just read from Hebrews chapter number 10. And um, just as a, a preliminary getting into this sermon, understanding where we're at, the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews specifically was, was designed and written towards the Jews at that time, the physical Hebrews, the people who had been worshiping the Lord and, and serving God. And now we're in the New Testament and there have been some changes made. So the book of Hebrews, if you want to understand the differences between the Old Testament and New Testament, one of the best places to, to look at and, and has the most information is the book of Hebrews. It really goes into detail and gives you the explanation of it as well. So we see here that, you know, it starts off by telling us about, you know, the blood of bulls and of goats and stuff and how Jesus Christ is that... Um, is the perfect sacrifice for us. He says, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats were ever able to take away sins. So the way that they would worship in the Old Testament is that they would bring in their sacrifices. They would bring in bulls. They would bring in goats. They would bring in all these various offerings to the tabernacle or to the temple, depending on what time in history we're at. And this is part of their service. This was part of, of how they worship God. And they only came, you know, usually there would be a few feasts a year that they would have to attend. And they had some different ceremonies than we observe today. And what we see here then, we, we segue into our service today. Now, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on. And the title of my sermon, I've got a few different titles, but one of them is, why you need to go to church. Why is church so important? See, unfortunately, we live in a time now where there's, there's a, like a popular thinking going around where people take a few verses out of context and they'll say, see, the Bible says where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Which, yes, the Bible says that. And yes, that's a true statement. But you know what that doesn't say? Where two or three are gathered together, I'm in church. Okay, that's not what the Bible says. But people want to take that and say, see, we could have church right here. We're having church right now. And people say, well, I'm having church every day when I wake up. I have church in my house. No, you don't. No, you don't. Now, we're going to get into some of the, the fallacies and, and false beliefs that, that people have about church. And just right off the bat, I'll tell you what, this building that we're in right now, this is not church. This building is not a church. The word church literally means a congregation. It is the people. The people make up the church. That is what the church is, and it's our gathering together. But I'll tell you what, it's not just a family dinner. Okay, when you sit down with your family, you could all be saved. You could say a prayer before you eat, but that is not church. There is an institution that God has created, that, that God has designed, that we need to be gathering together in a congregation to hear the, 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 the word of God preached and to sing praises unto his name. And we're going to go through why church is so important. We're going to start here in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews actually has some stern warnings for us about not going to church. Let's look here. We're going to start reading again in verse number 19. Look at verse number 19 where we start here, Hebrews chapter 10. The Bible reads, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. And I'm going to stop right here. He's talking about, he, he's using the reference of the temple, of the old holy place. If you remember, we, we've been going over this through the book of 1 Kings when we're describing the temple. The temple was made as the house of God, right? That was supposed to be God's dwelling place among the children of Israel, among his chosen people. He built this temple, and inside the temple, you'd have the altar, you'd have some various things, and then there was the holiest of all, the holiest of holies, and it was only allowed for the high priest to go in once a year with the blood of bulls and of goats to, to make atonement for the people, and that was something that was off limits except for you know, very specific circumstances. It had to be the high priest. And what he's saying is that we have a high priest. Now we have an eternal high priest. Jesus Christ has replaced the old order. He replaced the old priesthood, the Levitical priesthood that started with Aaron and, and, and went down through his descendants through the years. They were the ones that held the office of the high priest. But when Jesus came, he became our high priest. And he wasn't born after the order of Aaron. 
He came from the house of Judah. So he was not, you know, uh, um, according to the Mosaic law, he was not to be the high priest. But when Jesus Christ came, that changed. God said, okay, we're done with, with this Levitical priesthood. Jesus Christ is the high priest. And now we have access into the holiest of all through Jesus Christ's blood. He, by, by his dying on the cross and his resurrection and providing salvation to us and being that one sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, the only sacrifice that could take away our sins, we have access into the holiest of all. And this is what he's explaining. And I just want to point out there, verse 21, because he says, and having a high priest over the house of God. The church is also called the house of God in the New Testament. Look at verse 22. He says, let us draw near. So let, let's come together. Let's draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. And look at verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And the day is referring to the day approaching is, is the end of the world. It's, a, it's the great day. It's a come, the return of Jesus Christ. As we see that day approaching, as the world becomes more and more wicked, he's saying, you need this so much the more. But let me back up a little bit because one of the, one of the reasons we come to church, he says here, let us consider one another. When you're considering one another, you're thinking about other people. He says, let's consider one another. Let's think about other believers, other members of the church let's think about them to provoke them unto love and to good works you see when we gather together we receive edification from each other when you're in this group you you, know, you spend your life out in the world in general you go to work you, you know you go to the grocery store you do all these things and you're surrounded by this world you're surrounded by the the, the influences of this world you're surrounded by most people who don't really care about God that much at all right. but when you come in the church you're surrounded by other people who think the way that you do. You're surrounded by people that, that have a faith in God's holy words and that have reverence for the scripture. And when we come here, one of the things that you get by being here and one of the things, not just that you get, but that you give. Because he's not even saying you come here looking to, to receive something from other people and let us consider one another. Let's be thinking about other people because there's people that have needs. There's people that go through hard times. We need to be provoking each other unto love and to good works. And then he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. There is an assembling of ourselves together. And that's what church is. It's the assembly. It's us, it's us gathering together in one place at a specific time to hold a church service. And he says, don't forsake the assembling. As the manner of some, you know what? There's some people, they forsake it. What does that mean? They have nothing to do with it. They never go. They never attend church. They never, there's assembling. Hey, all the believers are getting together. Yeah, I got other things to do. Eh, the football game's on. Ah, whatever. Whatever the excuse, whatever the reason. Oh, I don't need to go to church because I have church at my house. No, you're not going to get the considering one another. And think about it. If, you're, if you say, well, I just have church at my house. Why so wake up in the morning with my family? Are you really considering the other believers? All you're considering is your own house. I mean, who doesn't do that? The world does that. Unbelievers do that. That's not church, my friends. Don't get sucked into this, into this mindset and this false you know, idea that that church is no longer important. You know, and it's, it goes along with those, those popular catchphrases, right? People say, well, I don't have a religion. I have a relationship. Now, here's why I don't like that. Because do I have a relationship? Yes, I do. And here's the relationship that we ought to have. Being a born again, where God is your father and you are his son. But see, that's not really what they're talking about when they say a relationship. They're talking more like a buddy-buddy relationship. Now, I'll tell you what, I've got four children with one more on the way. I love my children. I do things with my children. We spend a lot of good quality time together, but I'm not their buddy. I'm their dad. I'm their father. So as being a loving father, I need to raise them properly. I have a different role than just maybe one of their friends might have with them. 
I have a totally different relationship and a totally different job with them than just being their buddy. And if you're born again, God is your father. He's your holy father in heaven. He's the rule maker. He's the one that tells you what you need to be doing and you know, what you should or should not be doing. We need to have a relationship with God, yes, but let's make sure we have the right relationship with him. One where he's our father and we're his children. And we're, we have reverence unto him and we're listening to him. And other than that, you know, the Bible says that pure religion and undefiled is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. So I do have a religion. It's a pure religion, though. It's not a vain religion. You know, people toss around religion like it's a bad word. Religion's not a bad word unless it's just used in hypocrisy and, and you've got these false teachers that are, that are bringing, you know, the, the, the name of Christ down and bringing, uh, going to church down and, and bringing things that are actually good and scriptural down to a point where people despise the church, despise religion, despise the things that actually ought to be good. But it doesn't make those things inherently bad when you get it when they're done the way that the Bible says they ought to be done. But I want to call your attention here to one more point in Hebrews chapter 10 because he's saying, look, we need to consider one another. We need to provoke each other unto love and to good works and not forsake the assembly. Let's gather together. Let's get our butts in church. Let's gather together. And he says, we need this. We need the exhortation so much the more. You say, why do you have three churches, church services a week? Because we need church. We need the gathering together. We need the exhortation from one another so much the more as we see the day approaching that the world is getting continually more and more wicked. And we need the strength from each other and the, the reassurance and, the, and the, the motivation and the exhortation to keep going, to keep fighting the good fight, not to slip, not to backslide, not to get caught up in this crazy, wicked, sinful world, but to be here for each other. But then he continues on. He says, so much more as you see the day approaching. Verse number 26, 4, which is a conjunction. It's, con it's connecting what we just read. 4, for this reason. 4, if we sin willfully... After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We get a very stern warning here. Now look, some people don't like the way that this is worded and they'll try to say, that, you know, for one, they'll, they'll, they'll falsely paint this as people going to hell. That's not what this verse is saying at all. It's very clearly talking about God's people. It's talking about believers. Many ways you can, you can look at this because he says, you know, under Moses' law, people died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now, you could be saved or unsaved and be judged by Moses' law when you commit a transgression. Is that true? Is there, I mean, is there, is there anything preventing a, a, a saved person from committing a capital crime? No, of course not. Saved people and unsaved people both commit crimes. And he's saying under the Mosaic law, they died under two or three witnesses. And he's saying, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified. When you're sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're saved. This is talking about a saved person. This is talking about someone who has been sanctified, who, who received Jesus Christ as their Savior. They received the forgiveness of sin through the blood of Jesus Christ, but they have this mindset where they're just, they're, they're treading the Son of God underfoot. They don't care about Jesus. They don't, they don't have anything to do with them, and they're just going off on their own, and they're, they're basically stepping and walking all over Jesus Christ. The one who died for them, their Savior. And he says, he, they, uh, um, Where were these things? An unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, verse 30, The Lord shall judge his people. 
God is a judge. Is he a, he's a judge of the whole world? Yes. He's a judge of the unbelievers? Yes. He's, and their judgment's going to be in cast in a lake, lake of fire. But he's also a judge of his people. God is a father. He's a loving father. And he's a judge. And I'll tell you what, even though you receive forgiveness of sins, you're never going to spend one minute in hell. That punishment is bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. When you breathe your last breath, God's going to take you home to be with him in heaven. However, that's not just a free pass on just all sin to just do whatever you want with no consequences. There are consequences. God is going to judge you in this world. God is going to rebuke you and chasten you and discipline you in this world if you decide to just say, oh, okay, well, I was already sanctified, so now I'm just going to go off and do whatever I want and not care about Jesus and not care about God and just live like the world and do whatever I want to do and just skip church and everything else. And he's saying, verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You better watch yourself. And what's interesting about all of this, because you could obviously, you could, I could preach an entire sermon on these verses, these last verses we just read here. But in the immediate context, it, it follows not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And then he goes into these points right here. Church is important. And he's warning us saying, look, don't forsake the assembling. Don't forsake being around God's people. Don't forsake this. Because there, it's going to lead you into things that are going to cause you to be uh, sorely punished. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about our church. You're here this morning. We got a, a visitor or two with us this morning as well. And um, just a little bit about Word of Truth Baptist Church. Because obviously, I think it's important to go to church. Now, we do not believe that this is the only church and only salvation is going to come through our church. Right? There's, there's some cults out there that believe that. They're going to say, you cannot be saved anywhere else but through our church, and it has to be here. Don't believe that here. Go wherever you want to go to church. It's not going to make you unsaved. Okay? We don't have this cult mentality, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about our church and what we believe here, starting with the name of our church, Word of Truth Baptist Church. That name was, was chosen three years ago because we are a church that exalts the truth. We care and we love the truth. And all we, all we want to know is the truth. Well, our endeavor is the truth. When we preach God's word, it's the truth. What's right? What's wrong? Tell, I, that's what we want to know. This is what we're going to lift up. I'm not going to lift up man's vain traditions. I don't care what other people, I don't care what people thought 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago. I'm not going to be looking back to some church fathers to get my knowledge of the truth. You know where I'm going to be going to get my knowledge of the truth? Right here. This is where I'm going to get my knowledge of the truth. And this is all I care about is, you know, if I have the Holy Spirit leading me, if I have, I would, you know, which I believe I'm saved, you know, the Spirit bear, beareth witness with our, with our spirit that we are the sons of God. I know I'm a son of God. So if I know I have, the, that I have the Spirit of God and I know I have God's Word in my hand, then there is no reason why I can't go directly to the source to get this knowledge and this truth. And in this church, this is what we exalt. This is what we care about. This is what we preach. This is what we're all about is the truth. We read it. We love it. We believe it. And we also don't make excuses for it. Right. It's God's word. There's no reason for us to try to change it to fit this world that gets more and more wicked every day. I'm not going to try to change or make excuse for what the Bible says in any chapter, in any book, in any verse to satisfy this wicked world. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that don't take that stand, though, and they keep backing down and they keep compromising. And as this world changes, they're afraid of being attacked. They're afraid of persecution. They're afraid of people coming after them and calling them haters and calling them whatever because they literally believe the Bible. I just read an article about some men. I think it was in like, like in Great Britain somewhere and like it was in England. Does that, anyone got a witness here? Someone saw the same article of two men. They were street preachers. And they got arrested, literally, for reading the Word of God. And they called it hate speech because they read the parts of the Bible that talk about sodomy, that talk about homosexuality, and that's an abomination, and that God put the death penalty on it. They literally quoted the Bible and got arrested for it. You say, yeah, but that's over in the, over in the UK. Well, it's coming here. Because everything that has been happening in the former motherland comes this way after a few decades. 
We're just a little bit behind the curve when it comes to, to political, you know, uh, culture and, and political events and stuff like that. So if you think that's not coming here, you're sorely mistaken. And the only way that you can combat that and stem the tide is, is to not back down, is to stand firmly on God's word, not to compromise, but say, you know what? This is what the book says, and I believe it. It is what it is. You, don't have, you have a problem with it, you take it up with God. You call me whatever names you want. I don't care. Doesn't matter to me. No skin off my back. But if you don't believe what the Bible says, that's on you. And we're not going to back down from it either. I, don't, I mean, you could do whatever you want to me. You could call me whatever you want. We are standing strong on the word of truth. And that'll help you understand a little bit about our church and where we come from. If you want to know what we believe, pick up one of these books on your way out and read it from cover to cover. That's our doctrinal statement. This is what we believe. Do you believe this part? Yep. Well, well what about this part over here? When it's, yep. That one too. We believe it all. <clears throat> now Hebrews 10, as I mentioned, we, this is the first passage we went to, has serious warnings about the forsaking of ourselves together. Now I'm not worried about someone getting offended because they think I'm trying to scare them into coming to church here. Right? Someone might have that idea like, oh, you're just bringing this up because you want to control people and you want them to come to your church and everything. Look, that's not my motivation at all. If you think that is, then, then you don't, you know, you're misinterpreting you know, the, what I'm preaching here because we're literally reading the Bible. And we're li literally reading what these verses say. So I'm just going to preach God's word and it says what it says. So, um, you know, I, but, I, but I'm not going to go at my preaching and my teaching of the word with any type of fear of what other people might think because I'm dedicated to the truth. And the truth of the Bible says we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together and that there are punishments associated with that. The other aspect, there's two main points of our church I just want to bring, bring across to you. One is the exaltation of the truth and the other one is preaching the gospel every creature. Those are the two main focuses of this church, the truth and the gospel. And the gospel is the truth, right? So you could tie it all together anyways, but, but that's something that'll, that'll separate this church and, and make us stand out. Um, also, this church has a pastor that genuinely cares about all its members. I pray for all the members of this church. I work a full-time job outside of this church. I prepare three sermons every single week for this church. And I won't ever ask anyone in this church to do something I won't do myself. I'm not one of those people that will say, do what I say and not as I do, right? And you guys do this, but I'm not going to do that. That's what the Pharisees did. Jesus said, you know, you know, listen to the things that they teach, but don't do what they do because they don't even lift a finger to do the things that they're telling you to do. But I'll tell you what, you won't have that hypocrisy here. Now, I'm not perfect, okay? I may fail sometimes, but I'm not going to encourage you or try to get you to do things that I won't do myself. And I'm also trying to be someone that you can look to as an example. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Just go backwards a little bit from Hebrews. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Because I'm trying to be someone that the Bible outlines the pastor is supposed to be. And it's someone that's supposed to be an example to the flock. And that's exactly what Paul charged Timothy. And you can read the epistles of Timothy and Titus, their, their um, exhortations and teaching from the apostle Paul to both of these men who were, who were pastors of churches. They were elders. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 12, the Bible reads, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. These are all things that the Bible is saying you as a pastor need to have these things. Why? Because church is important and you're going to have a congregation, a group of people here that are looking to you. You need to be the example. You need to be the one that can give an example to believers in their word, in their conversation, which is more than just speaking. That's in the, in the daily, day-to-day -day life and activity, in your charity, in your spirit, in your faith, and in your purity. Verse 13, he says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. All things are to be done in the church. He's, he's telling them to do these things. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. 
Look at this, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Bible and, and with the New Testament way of, of ordaining preachers and pastors, when, when someone is ordained a pastor of a church, there are hands laid on that person. And they are sent, you know, they're either taking over a church, or they're starting a church. This is the, the, the way, the New Testament way that, that men are ordained to pastor churches. And when the laying on of the hands happens, there's a gift that's given to that person to do the job now that they need to do as a pastor. And I firmly believe this. I've experienced this firsthand. The transition from me becoming a lay person to becoming a pastor, I know all too well. I had, I had studied, I had, I had gone through my own training and, and learning and preaching and everything I did for seven years being taught. But something different happened after I was ordained to pastor this church. The preaching changed, my understanding changed, a lot of things. It's, it's not, not to the extreme as your salvation. So like... Any of you knows who got, when you got saved, if you tried reading the Bible before you got saved, didn't make much sense, did it? Because a natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit. The Bible, God's Word, are spiritually discerned. And just as I remember that difference because I was 20 years old when I got saved. And I had tried reading the Bible before, never knew what it meant at all. Just words that didn't make a whole lot, I mean... They made sense in the, just in the, in the regular English reading of the book, but overall didn't make much sense to me. Didn't see very much to it. After my salvation, wow, the light, the light came on. Wow, I understand this stuff now. Oh, I see what it's saying. I get it. To a smaller degree, but similar experience after the laying on of hands and, and being sent out and starting a church with the preaching, with the teaching, with all the various things that need to happen. And, and, you know, as far as that goes, you know, you could take my word for it, but look at what the Bible's saying here. He's saying, look, don't neglect that gift to Timothy. I don't believe that's just a gift given to Timothy. I believe it happens at the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Because it wasn't just the apostle Paul that laid hands on him. He said it was laying on of the presbytery. It's more than just one person. There's multiple people involved in, in laying on of hands for Timothy to be ordained to preach. So he says, and then in verse 16, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So these are the, this is the exhortation and, and the charge that Paul is giving Timothy. Why? Because his job is so important. Why? Because God has ordained an institution called the local church. And that as an elder, as a bishop, as a pastor, Timothy has an important job. And he needs to make sure that, one, he takes heed to himself, that he's making pure, that he's being a good example, and that he is having good doctrine that comes straight from the Word of God and continue in that doctrine. Finally, when it comes to this church, I was giving you a little bit of example about myself. This church is a real church. It's not just a pastor. No church is just or should be just a pastor. There's way more to a church than one man, than one person. We do not have a cult of personality here. I don't have that great of a personality to begin with. <laughs> if it was just a cult of personality, we'd have a, we, well, we probably would have nobody here because I don't have that type of personality. But this church and any church, it doesn't matter. You, know, you see them, you've seen the big names, you see the people who are very charismatic and that people just love that person, right? And they could draw a big crowd. But that's not what a church is supposed to be. A church is the congregation. It is, it is you and me. It is all of us here is the church. And the people that we have here are awesome. Anyone who spent a little bit of time with our church should know that the people here love God. We have a church family here. We care about each other. We exhort one another. That's why we do that. We have the fellowships. We, we get to know, hey, what's going on? We're praying for each other and exhorting each other. This church is awesome. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up going to church once a week on Sunday morning. That was a normal routine for me. I grew up going to Presbyterian church, and uh, it's what we did. And honestly, that's the way that, that most churches still operate today. Uh, Baptist church is a little bit different, but, um, but in general, well, even a lot of Baptist churches, I mean, you just go, you know, Southern Baptist, all these various churches, usually most churches will have just one service a week. Now, 
and I'll get into that in a second. It, it was something that we basically, so when I was growing up, it was something we basically did, and it was kind of like we checked it off the list, right? Went to church today. Don't have to think about it again until next week. Oh, yep, went to church today. Got that done, got that taken care of because it's just something I'm supposed to do, right? That's not what church is all about. I, I pray that it's not just a checklist item for you that just says, well, we got to go. Yo, know, hopefully you're like the psalmist has said, you know, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. That it should be something that you look forward to. It's something exciting. Now, when I finally found a church that is sim very similar to this one, the church that I was sent out of to start this church, they offered three service times. I went to Sunday morning only, the, just their Sunday morning service for a few weeks because that's what I was used to. That's the pattern I was in. That's what, that's what I did, right? And it didn't take very long of going and hearing good preaching, good teaching, being around good people to know, I want to be here more. I didn't take convincing. No one, no one had to tell me, oh man, you, you know, I can't believe you're not coming to church. And, and I'm just going to clear this up right now. I'm not saying that if you don't come to all of our church services, you're not right with God. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you're forsaking the assembly, so don't, you know, don't misconstrue what I'm saying. Okay, I'm, I'm not saying that. Because I don't believe that, you know, forsaking is, you're forsaking. Okay. But... The goal, hopefully, is, is to understand first that, like Hebrews 10 says, we need it so much the more. I believe it's necessary. I think it's something you should be. I think, I think you should be trying to get to church as much as you can, especially in this dark and sinful world. This is, this is you know, am I, is it a sin to not come? No, I do not believe that at all. I don't believe it's a sin to not come to church. But you also have to ask yourself is, is the way that I'm living my life, am I just trying to make sure I'm doing the minimum just without sinning, right? I mean, where is your heart as far as it comes to serving God? Do you, do you really love God? Do you want to serve him? Are you excited about it? Do you want to do what you can? Or do you just want to get by just to make sure you're not in sin, right? You just want to make sure you're not in sin and show up to church sometimes and just don't forsake it, right? Then you're not in sin. But if you love God, if you love, and hopefully if you love the church, if you love learning, if you love going through a lot of Bible, and turn, if you would, to uh, Jeremiah chapter 3 for me while I'm, while I'm preaching here. If you, if you love getting into the Word of God and hearing these various topics preached, you love the truth and you love other people, and you want to exhort other people, then, then come to church more often. Come to church when we gather, when we have these times, when we have these congregations. I started going faithfully to all three services really quickly. Why? Because I love the church. I like going. I like learning. And I knew I had a lot to learn. And I'll tell you what, just, just from a personal perspective, a different perspective than maybe you had thought about. In a good church that has a good pastor, and I'm not trying to lift myself all up at all, believe me, so, so uh, um, the pastor cares about you. I think about every individual in this church that comes to this church, and I do pr I pray for everybody, but not only do I pray for them, I pray that God will help me to be able to preach messages, to, to, to open up my eyes to things in Scripture that other people need to hear, that, that is going to be beneficial for them. Because I don't always know what's going on in your life. I usually don't. I usually don't know that much to, to know, you know, oh, I'm dealing with this or that. And I, I just continue to pray, God, you know what's going on. Lead me to, to whatever it is you would have me to preach. I pray this prayer every single week. Every week. Now, sometimes there's things that I do know about. And if I think there's something that can help you by being taught from God's word, then I'm going to teach it. I'm going to go there and I'm going to do it. And, and, and this is my care for you. So if you realize that, that there's often times I'm, I might be thinking about you specifically or God might be thinking about you specifically, I'm going to preach whatever it is that I've got planned to preach, whether you're here or not. Hopefully, if it's something that you need to hear, you are here. If it's something that, that you can benefit from, and what I'm saying is that when you have someone that cares about you, when you have someone who's, who's trying to help you out, it's important to come and to show up. You don't know what you miss sometimes. And you, and you can't even always rely and say, oh, but when I'm not here, I catch it on video. Well, sometimes the video fails. 
And I'll tell you what, church still isn't just a sermon. You get more out of being here than just hearing from God's word, being around the people, receiving the exhortation from the others that are in this church is going to help you also. And it's a big help. That's not just a side point to church. It is a main focus. In Hebrews 10, that was the main focus, provoking one another unto love and good works. It didn't even bring up the teaching. The teaching's biblical. We get, I mean, we're, we're going there right now. We're in Jeremiah chapter 3. But it's not just some side mention. It is an extremely important aspect. So all of it, the whole package is important. And I'm not even touching the singing and praise unto God this morning because I've got too many other things that I'm, that I'm covering. But, but just praising God and being in the congregation and singing praise unto God, that is also very important. But let's look here in Jeremiah chapter 3. Because learning is a critical part of coming to church. It is, one, it is one of the very important parts. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse number 14. The Bible reads, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. For I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. This is God saying, look, I'm married unto you. Now, we know in Ephesians chapter 5 that, the, that God likens the church as the bride of Christ. It talks about as we are married as husbands to our wife, that, that so is Jesus Christ married to the church. So this applies. Yes, Jeremiah 3 is in the Old Testament. Turn to Ephesians 4. Jeremiah 3 is in the Old Testament. He says, I'm married unto you. In that time, he's talking to his people as the nation of Israel, as the people of Israel. But in the New Testament, we are his people. As believers, we are his people and we are married unto him. And just as he gave them pastors then, he's giving, them past, he's giving us pastors today. And the job of the pastor, the, the point of God giving a pastor is to feed you with knowledge and understanding. Knowledge, the, the, the truth from the Word of God, and the understanding, the application, the, the, the what does it mean behind it. This is a God-given role. Now, again, just to differentiate, we're not like you know, the Catholic Church has historically been where they'll say that you, you know, no lay person can understand the Bible. It has to be only understood through the priest. That's not what we believe, Right? Anybody who's born again should be able to understand and receive teaching from God's word and receive it directly. There's nothing that I, that you need to hear at church that you could not learn on your own. However, that being said, God still ordained a place for church and for pastors to provide teaching. Just because you don't, you know, it's the same thing. You don't have to learn physics from a teacher. You can learn completely out of a book. But going and having someone instruct you who already knows the material is probably going to help you learn a lot faster than trying to figure it all out on your own. So coming to church, you're coming to hear someone who, and again, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, is not supposed to be a novice, not someone who's brand new to this, not someone who just got saved, but somebody who's already been deemed faithful by other people that has a knowledge, that is able to teach, that is apt to teach, that is able to do these things, that, that, that is part of the job. They've already been, been determined by a group of people, yes, this person has these qualifications, has these skills, and has this knowledge to be able to pass on to other people. And that's what you're getting when you come to church, is hearing from pastors that have that knowledge, that should be a good teacher, that's able to help teach you and provide you with understanding. And God has ordained that. God wants you to hear and receive some learning and teaching from a pastor. You're in Ephesians chapter 4, hopefully you get, get there. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11. This is a common place that I, I would like to show people when I'm out preaching gospel. If someone gets saved and I want to explain the importance of coming to church. I actually, I have this passage highlighted in my, my Bible. I take this out soul winning with me just so that it could show, you know, this passage here. We're going to start reading in verse number 11. And to show you that God specifically has given certain people gifts in order to preach and teach. Verse 11, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. 
for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So all those passages are basically saying is that, you know, he's given some apostles, some prophets, some pastors and teachers. And the point is for the perfecting of the saints. When you're already sanctified, when you're born again, there needs to be growth. Think about it. When you first receive Christ as your Savior, you're an infant, you're a baby in Christ. You're just a little child. You need to learn and grow and understand more. And, and you start to get that understanding. You get the milk from the Word. And you start to grow. But when you have someone there to help you along with your development, a teacher that's able to break things down and to put all the studying together. Look, I put a lot of time into these sermons. I put hours into preparing the sermons that I can deliver to you. So when you come to church, hey, yeah, that sounds great. We're going to Hebrews 10. We're going to 1 Timothy 4. We're going to Jeremiah 3. We're going to Ephesians 4. We're going to be going to Ephesians 5. We're going to Luke 10. We're going to Luke 14. Okay? I put that together for you. And it's not, be, look, I, I don't want like any accolades for it, but I'm just trying to express that there's a lot of work and effort going into this for you. For you. These are things that I'm al I already know, but I want to teach them unto you and help you to grow and help you understand the importance of this and to prove from Scripture why this is so. And, I, and, I, and I, that's a very big burden for me. I don't ever want to say something in, to you guys, to this church, and just expect you to believe what I say because I say it or because God has ordained me to be a pastor of this church. No, the reason isn't because of that. It's because it's in the scripture. That is the reason why we believe what we believe. The point of showing you Ephesians 4 is to show you that, look, God has given some people to be pastors and teachers, and this is the purpose of it. And he goes in to explain, you know, there's, there's a lot of people out there that have bad doctrine. There's a lot of people out there that are trying to deceive you. And this is one of the reasons why people don't like going to church, because there are so many frauds out there. There are so many people that are just after your money. There are so many people that don't care about you, that are going to teach lies for their own benefit, that, that don't actually preach what the, what the Bible actually says. And it gives people bad taste in their mouth and it gets people jaded with going to church and they didn't want to have nothing to do with it. Because maybe they had some bad experience. Someone stole money from them. They kept telling them, oh, you know, give money, you know, keep giving money, keep giving money. And then the pastors found out just, just you know, in all kinds of sin and adultery and everything else. And it's like, why would you want to go be part of that? But that's not God's church. That's not the way that he ordained it to be. And there's too many people like that, so that's why it's so important to get into a good church, people who, who hold reverence to God's word and are going to teach it. And look, you don't, I, I encourage everyone in this church, read the Bible for yourself. I mean, read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, because you need to be the judge, ultimately, of whether or not what I'm saying is true. You have to take some responsibility. Don't just come, yeah, come here and learn. Come and get some teaching. But challenge everything that I say with God's word. Does it stand the test? Does it line up with scripture? That's what I ask you to do. And if you come here and you're finding out that everything I'm saying, you know what, that doesn't line up, then find another church, but don't forsake church. If God has gone through the trouble of creating this institution known as the local church, and has very specific qualifications for the person that is to be ordained as the elder or bishop. And Jesus Christ actually died for it, as it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. The Bible reads, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He gave himself for the church. All of these things that, that is, is being put into this emphasis on the church, don't you think that it should be something that you should take seriously? 
I mean, if God puts an emphasis on this, shouldn't we be putting an emphasis on this as well? Please don't underestimate the importance of attending church. And this is why we started off in Hebrews chapter 10. Now, um, this is an individual thing that you have to decide for yourself. As I mentioned already, I'll, I'll bring it up again. I'm not saying it's a sin if you don't come to every single church service we hold here. I'm not saying that. But I am asking you to, to just look at your own priorities. Okay? And don't think I'm asking you to come to all the church services because I want your money. I don't care about that. This has nothing to do with money. You don't ever, you could come to this church, all the church services, you could have the free food, you could have the free stuff and never put a dime in the plate and I don't care and you're still welcome here. It doesn't matter to me. It's not about the money. That's not our motivation at all. Come to everything we offer and pay nothing. I don't care. But I do believe that church is important for all the reasons listed. And what I'm asking you to do is where, just question what are your own priorities? How much time do you set aside for God? How important is it for you to, to, to come and to hear from God's word and try to get some learning? How important is it for you to come and maybe be a benefit to other people in this church? How much do you care about them? Do you want to edify other people? Maybe between church today, someone might have some bad news and some bad things happen to them, but then everybody else stays out of church and now they come to church and there's hardly anybody here to help comfort them. Who knows? I don't know. It's not out of the realm of possibility. Things like that happen. But, but you know, how, how much does that matter to you? Would you like to have been there and say, oh man, I could have been there, but I decided I was just a little bit too tired and I wanted to take a nap. Or what about a new believer? Maybe we go out soul winning and then some new believer comes into church. Don't you want to be there to kind of help encourage them and, oh man, get to meet them, you know, be, be nice to them and help and just... just Offer to help them out wherever you can. I mean, it, these are things that you have to ask yourself. And how about maybe just for yourself to hear something that God laid on my heart to, to having you in mind to preach on? All of these things, just, just ask yourself, how important are these things to you when you're determining how much am I going to go to church? When, when, you know, when should I go? How, you know, uh, just, just decide that for yourself. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 10. I understand that, that people get themselves in different, different situations and sometimes for legitimate reasons it, it just simply might not be possible to attend the church services or all of them or what have you, right? Whether it be you're physically incapable, whatever, okay? And, and I get that and, I'm, and you know what? That's between you and God. God will understand that and that's why I'm saying it's not some sin to not come to all the church services but more often than not, what keeps people out of church is not the, the, the reasons that everybody would understand, you know, including God. Usually it's other things. Usually it's about you're busy just with something else. Something else takes a priority that you just, well, I just want to do this instead. Uh, Luke chapter 10, look at verse number 40. We see <clears throat> Jesus speaking. He, he goes to uh, Martha's house, where Martha and Mary and verse number 40 of Luke 10, the Bible reads, But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. So Martha, she's not doing a bad thing. She's not sinning. She's not off in the world. She's serving. She's got guests at her house, and she's working, and she's, she's doing all this stuff, and Jesus is there, but she's doing all this other prep work, and she's saying, Jesus, you know, can you just, can you tell my sister, you know, to, to, to get over here and, and give me a hand, because I'm doing it all myself. But look at Jesus' answer to her. He says in verse 41, and Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Mary chose to listen to Jesus. When he was in their presence, when he was there, she said, you know what? I know there's all these other things that need to get, that need to get done, right? Because we have these, these, these thoughts and we have these things and oh, this needs to get done and this needs to get done and this needs to be done. They're not bad things. But where are your priorities? He's saying this is needful. This is needful. You know, the, the, the serving, getting everything on the plates, getting everything washed and stuff, at this moment, you can put that aside because Jesus is here. 
Because you could listen to the teaching. All that stuff can take, could go on the back burner. Right, right now, this is needful. Yeah. And we have a tendency to get so wrapped up in everything else in our lives. And I think this is one of the reasons why the, you know, getting a lot of riches is ultimately a big trap. Because when you, when you have more wealth, you tend to have more things. And the more things you have, the more of your attention it's going to take. Say, so, well, we got a boat. Well, now we got to store it. Now I got to prepare it. I got to winterize it. I got to do this. Oh, we got the second home. Oh, I got to take it. And, and, and all of a sudden, your time gets split up into all of these things. And that's why the Bible said you can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and money. It's one or the other. You got to be focused on one or the other. Just decide for yourself what is important. What is important? And is, is it, is, are all these other things that you need to do so important that you can't attend one of the church services, right? And again, that's, that's your own priority. That's your own list. You decide what you want to do. But we see here a very good example. Martha's doing nothing wrong or sinful, and she's actually trying to, to probably serve Jesus, right? But Mary did what was right. And, and he said, this is needful, and she needs to be here, and she chose that. That's what she's going to do. And I'm sure Jesus wouldn't have had any problems with Martha saying, well, all this stuff's going to have to wait because I want to hear what you have to say. Jesus probably would have been like, very good. <laughs> You're doing the right thing. Listen to what I have to say. Turn, if you would, to Luke 14. You're in Luke chapter 10. And ask yourself this, how hard is it or how easy is it for you to miss church, to just to skip out, to not, to not attend? What is it that has to happen for you to say, I'm not going to church today. What, what, what type of, uh, of scenario is that? Is it because you're on vacation? Is it because you're tired? Is it because you got the sniffles? <laughs> is it the weather? Is it raining? Is it snowing? Is there a football game on TV? These are all things that people just say, well, I'm not going to church. Now look, if you're really, I, I said the sniffles because I was kind of joking about that, but I mean, if you're sick, don't come and get everybody else in church sick. Stay home. You don't have to prove your, your piety and, and your d dedication to God by coming into church when you're ill, okay? God, God understands that, and we understand that, and it's a lot better to not get everybody sick and everybody down and, and for you just to take one for the team and, 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 and stay back at home for a little while. And I appreciate the dedication. Look, I'm someone who's always been dedicated, or at least since I got right with God and got in good church, to want to be there all the time. It's just because I love it, because it's something I want to do, and, and it was something that was important to me. I made a decision in my own life that just said, I'm always going to be in church. I mean, as, as much as is possible for me, I'm going to be there. So I'm the type of person who also works that way too. So when I get sick, I tend to work through being sick and things like that. But honestly, when it comes to being sick, if you, you, know, if you think you're contagious or anything like that, please don't, you know, don't come. But everything else, you, you know, what, is, what is the reason that's going to keep you out of church? When I was thinking about this, it, it, it called to my mind Luke 14. Because everyone has an excuse. Everyone has a reason. And it may make sense to you, but does it make sense to God is the big question. Look at Luke 14, verse number 16. The Bible says, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bad many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to a servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father 
and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. These are the teachings of Jesus Christ. He was saying, you know, he gives this parable, this example of this, of this man who, who creates this great supper, it's a great feast. And he invites his friends, he invites his people, and they all just make excuses. Oh, well, I can't be there because, you know, I, I did this and I did that and I just got married and all these other things. Well, I just can't make it. And do you notice he gets angry? Why would he get angry? Because it's disrespectful when someone invites you to the supper like that and, and goes through all the effort. He's putting forth a lot of work in preparing that meal. He's the one who's, who's you know, spent his resources and set the table and, and called and gave the invitation and everything else. And now you're just saying, well, I got this going on and I got that going on, which all of these things that they're saying could all be done another time, right? It's not that big of a deal. They're all lame excuses, right? Nothing that is just so pressing, not like, hey, I just chopped my arm off and I'm in the ER. I can't make it, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's nothing to that extreme at all. These are all just Oh, I got this other business going on. I'm cumbered about with much business. I've got too many things going on to come and, and participate in what you've already prepared for me. And he gets angry saying, you know what? We're going to get everybody in this house. Why? Because the master wants his house filled. He wants to have a lot of people in his house. I think we could take this parable and apply it to church, God's house. God wants you to be here. Look, there's messages, there's food prepared for you. There's good meat in God's word that's prepared for you. And he wants you to be here. He wants you to come. And he wants the whole house to be filled. I mean, he, want, he wants all kinds of people coming. And then he follows up this parable. And that's why we read verses 26 and 27. And he explains, he says, look, if you want to be my disciple. Now, there's a difference between being Jesus' disciple and just being saved, being a child of God you just have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what the Bible says. But he says, if you want to be my disciple, that's someone who actually follows Jesus. That's someone who's right there with Jesus. If you want to do all the work and if you want to follow him and you want to be close to him and doing what he has you to do, he says, being my disciple is a lot of work. He says, you can't be my disciple if you don't hate your father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters and your own life also. He says, you can't be my disciple. He says, you have to be willing to put everything on the line for me. That's what it means. You're saying hate your, it doesn't mean like, like have hatred in your heart towards, towards your parents and your own family. What he's saying is that if it comes down to a choice between Jesus and your family, you're picking Jesus. He's saying that he is first, that you need to be able to, to do, you know, if you want to be his disciples, it's all about Jesus. And he says, whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me. Think about bearing a cross. You know, it's a common phrase. You actually think about Jesus was bearing his own, his own death instrument he was carrying. And that's some pretty heavy stuff. Yeah. And he's saying, if you're not able to do that and come after me, then you can't be my disciple. Jesus has a high standard. God has a high standard for us. The bar is not set really low. God sets the bar really high for us. He sets the bar at perfection, okay? He knows we all fall short, which we do. He's provided us with a Savior, but the standard hasn't changed. And if we love God, if we love our Father, if we love Jesus, if we love our Savior, why don't we try to meet that high standard for Him? Why don't we forget all of the garbage and the, and the much business that could distract us and get focused on serving the Lord, starting with coming to church? If you notice, we've been doing these challenges. We're going to continue doing these challenges until I can't think of any more challenges to do. And then we're going to start them all over again. Okay? And the challenges are designed to help us to do more for God. In every aspect, in every area of our life, if you've been good with these first two so far, just wait. I'm going to hit something that you're not doing that good at because none of us is perfect and we all need help get, you know, getting other whatever right in our life. And, and, and excelling more and trying to do more for the Lord. <clears throat> Get to church. The, you know, church is so, people are starting to realize this. People have been moving across the country and even across the world to go to a good church, 
That's how important it is for some people. We have many people, th this church consists of people already that have moved to become and be part of this church. And there's other churches that are, that are very similar to ours that have the same exact thing going on in their churches. If people are moving to become and be a part of the church and you already live here, take advantage of being here. Let the, hopefully that'll say something to you a little bit about our church. Help us to do a great work for the Lord because the people here love God. We want to serve God to the utmost. We want to do what we want to turn the world upside down with this doctrine. Amen. Just as the disciples did in the book of Acts. They caused a big stir. People got to know, not them individually, they got to know the doctrine. Right. Okay? They may have known and be able to it doesn't matter. Right. We're not out for fame and glory. We're out for the fame that Solomon achieved in our Wednesday night Bible study that we read that, that when the Queen of Sheba came, she heard the fame concerning the name of the Lord. Amen. That's the fame that we want to achieve. It's the fame that goes straight up to Jesus. Amen. That's what we want to have going on here. So come be a part of this church. If you, if you don't come all the time, try to make it an effort and make a point to come and, and be here more often and, and, and edify one another and get to know other people, really become and be a part of our family here and, and get some more learning, get some doctrine, get to know everyone and be an encouragement for other people. The Bible says that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15 says, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church, right here, our congregation, according to the Bible, is the pillar and ground of the truth. It's important. It's, it's, a, it's, it's monumental. It's a pillar, right? It's something that, that ought to be a, a steadfast and unmovable. Church is important. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for instituting and ordaining um, churches and and people to lead those churches, dear God, and for us all to, to gather and congregate together. There's so much benefit that we receive from being in church. And Lord, I know that there's a lot of people that listen online and, and, and other things, dear God, but I pray that you would please help them all to find a good church to, be, to become a part of because they, they probably don't even realize everything that they're missing, and they're definitely missing uh, your, your commands from the Bible. Lord, if they're not getting in a church, I pray that you would please help us all to make sure that no matter where we're at, whether we're living here or somewhere else, and even if people don't come to our church, God, I pray that you please help them to make sure that they have it that solid, they have their priorities set, that they will be in a church that, that exalts the truth, someone, a church that loves you, dear Lord, and a church that is full of other like-minded believers, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.